Now, as we go to the Word today, I want you to read a scripture with me in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. This is a passage the Lord put on my heart to give you as a word from God for your life and mine as we step into this new year. Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, this was God's word to Joshua as he was preparing him to lead the people into the promised land. Read it with me out loud. I will give you every place you set your foot as I promised Moses. Once again, I will give you every place you set your foot as I promised Moses. Now, you can be seated when you've told two people, set your foot somewhere this year. Psychologist Alfred Adler coined the term inferiority complex. He said that everyone really suffers with it. And when he developed his theory of human behavior and what motivates human behavior, he said that we're motivated internally by a striving for superiority. A striving for superiority. He did not mean that we're striving to be superior to other people, but rather we're striving to conquer our basic sense of inadequacy. If anyone ever had a poor image of himself and a lack of confidence, it was Joshua. For 40 years, he had been Moses' personal aide through the wilderness years. And God called him to follow Moses as the next leader of Israel. Can you imagine following Moses? And I'm sure he felt like, and I'm sure people said, you've got some big shoes to fill. Maybe you've heard somebody say that to you. But the truth is, God never calls you to fill anybody else's shoes, but to walk in your own shoes and be the person God called you and created you to be. And he felt overwhelmed by the task. And the opening of the book of Joshua really records God speaking to him in his heart to give him a sense of confidence so that he could lead the people of Israel. Here was Joshua. He had to follow Moses. They're still making movies today about Moses' life. That's how great he was. Moses, the man of God. Moses, who led the people out of Egypt. Moses, who withstood Pharaoh to his face. Moses, who brought the ten miracles and judgments of God upon Egypt. Moses, who brought manna from heaven. Moses, who brought water from a rock. Moses, who received the law of God on tablets of stone. Moses, who spoke with God face to face as a man speaks into his friend. Moses, who designed the tabernacle and later the temple. Moses, who established the priesthood of Israel, the great prophet of God, the great teacher of Israel, Moses, the lawgiver, Moses, the man of promise, Moses, the man of God. And now Moses goes to be with the Lord at 120 years of age, and the mantle is upon Joshua. And even though there had been a service where Moses laid his hands upon Joshua in the presence of the people and they knew that Moses was blessing him and that God was raising him up yet he still had that inner sense of inadequacy I don't know if you know this or not but his actual name his birth name is not Joshua it is Hoshea according to number 13:8 and Hoshea in Hebrew means salvation Moses changed his name to Joshua. What he did was add the name Jehovah to his birth name. The Lord is salvation. And when you begin to get God in your identity, it's going to change your level of confidence. You won't be saying, I can do all things. You'll be saying, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he gives him a word of hope and a word of direction for his life as they prepare to enter the promised land. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. And maybe you're in one right now, a wilderness where there's no growth, there's no vegetation, there's no life, there's no hope. And now they're going into a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of 
abundance, a land of opportunity. And he says, for you to get out of where you are and to get into the promise, I will give you every place you set your foot as I promised Moses. In other words, if you don't step your foot on it, it'll never be yours. If you don't get walking, you're going to stay right where you are. But I'll give you, God says, every place you set your foot. The promised land simply represents the place of abundance that God has for all of us. I don't know if you know this or not, but God created you to live a blessed life. This is the will of God. Think about the creation. The very first thing the Bible says that God did when he created Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, and God blessed them. Turn to somebody and say, you are blessed. So many people are looking for a blessing. I want you to become aware of the fact that you are blessed. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. Moses tried to teach the people that it was God's will to bless them if they would just live the way that God called them to live. In Deuteronomy 28, 3, all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. The first psalm of the 150 psalms gives us a portrayal of God's will to bless us. Blessed is the man. That's how the whole psaltery begins. Blessed is the man and the woman who delights in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a what? Like a tree planted by rivers of living water who brings forth fruit in season. His leaf shall not wither and whatever he does prosperous. Isaiah told the people that it was God's will to bless him in Isaiah 1 verse 19. If you are willing and obedient, you will enjoy the best. You will enjoy the best of the land. God has a best life for every one of us. Jesus himself said one of the most famous statements of his in John 10, I've come that you might have life and what? Have it more but You know what abundant means? It means to fill something to the place that it now spills over. It doesn't mean to be full. It means to be running over. Like the psalmist said, my cup runneth over. Abundance doesn't mean to be full. It means you have so much in your life that it's flowing out of your life. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you. There's that word abundance. So that at all times, in every way, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than you ask or even think possible, according to his power that is at work in you, James 1, 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of life in whom there is no variables or shadow of turning. Just as God had a promised land for Israel, just as he had a better place for them, God has a promise for your life. God has a better place for your life. And he says, if you will start moving in faith, I will give you every place you set your foot. But you got to step on it. Now, when we listen to this challenge and we take it to heart for ourselves because the Bible is a timeless book, even though Joshua's gone and this part of history has moved on, what God says in his word is timeless and eternal for every one of us. The Bible says all scripture is inspired of God and is useful, including this passage right here. So just as God said to Joshua, that principle exists for every one of us. I will give you every place you set your foot as I promised Moses. Now, there's some important lessons here. The first lesson is if you're going to move into your promise, if you're going to live a better life, if you're going to move forward into everything God has for you, the first thing you have to do is get out of the land you're living in. Right? Right? Because setting your foot means you're, you're done with the desert. Come on. That sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. Say it. I'm done with the desert. <laughs> I'm done with this desert in my finances. I'm done with this desert in my soul. I'm done with this desert in my business. I'm done with this desert in my ministry. I'm done with this desert in my marriage. I'm done with this desert. 
Now, I used to think that the first law of success was desire, but I've rethought that. I think the first law of success that comes right before desire is discontentment. When you and I get discontented of being where we are and who we are and like we are, and we say, I've had enough of that. Now, systems theory teaches us that things in life tend to stay the way they are unless they are intentionally disrupted. So whatever patterns you have for your life, for your thinking, for your marriage, for your family, for your money, you by nature and so will I will always continue to do the things by nature. If anybody ever says to you, oh, I like change, they don't know what they're talking about. Nobody likes change. It's not the natural order of things to change anything. It's the natural order of things to stay the same. But when you're tired of things being the way they are, now you're ready to take a step. And taking a step means I'm taking a step out of the land I'm living in, and I'm taking a step toward a better land. I'm taking a step out of the life I'm living, and I'm taking a step into the life that is God's best for me. Now, why do we stay the same? That's a fair question. Why do we stay like we are? There are several reasons. One, we have poor self-esteem. We don't think we deserve anything better. Even though we're created by God, even though Jesus gave his life to redeem us, even though we have all these promises in the Scripture, somehow we tell ourselves, I don't deserve it. Maybe you don't, but God wants to give it to you. So your poor self-esteem and mine will give us the feeling, I don't deserve anything. And I've even heard people actually articulate that and say, I don't deserve anything better. I deserve what I'm getting. The second reason we stay like we are is perfectionism. If it can't be perfect, it keeps us paralyzed. But nothing in life is perfect, but it can be better. And perfectionists, I've struggled with perfectionism all my life. The perfectionist believes I've got to be perfect, perfect to be loved and worthwhile. Everything's either everything or nothing. But you've got to realize that life is a blend of the good and the bad, of the successes and the failures. And I had to get comfortable when I first started preaching as a pastor. I wanted to edit every sermon on Sunday because of all the mistakes I made. You're sitting there listening to all the things you enjoy. I'm sitting here documenting everything I'm messing up. And that's what perfectionists do with everything. They see the bad in everything. They see the fault in everything. And they pick everything apart. And perfectionism will paralyze us from ever having any progress in our lives. There's a third reason we stay the way they are, and that's procrastination. And why do we procrastinate? From the Latin, pros, forward, crass, tomorrow. To project today into tomorrow. Why do we do that? Because we are afraid of failure. People don't procrastinate because they're undisciplined. They procrastinate at an emotion level because they are afraid of failing. And the best way to never fail is don't do anything. There was a company that surveyed their employees, and one of the questions they asked was, do you have a dream for your life? And nearly every employee responded yes. And then the follow-up question was, do you plan to do anything specifically today to help you fulfill your dream? And most people said, no, but I plan to start doing it tomorrow. William Barclay, the Bible scholar, says the most dangerous day in a person's life is when he or she discovers the word tomorrow. And we're starting the first year off, and I know many of us want to make changes. That's a wonderful, healthy thing to do, although your internal mechanism is going to fight the changes you want to make. Your nature is going to fight the changes you want to make. That's why Mark Twain said, I've had more problems with myself than any man I've ever met. And many people are going to change their diet, they're going to exercise, they're going to read more, they're going to watch less TV, they're going to go out on more. We have a whole litany, and that's wonderful to have those things, but oftentimes we procrastinate and we never get around to it. There was a man who, whose doctor told him he really needed to lose some weight, gave him some, some routines and some exercises for his health, and he, he goes back to the doctor 
Six months later for a physical, and the doctor was really upset because looking at him, he said, you know, you're not doing any exercises. He said, yes, I am. He said, in fact, I've made a list of all the exercises I am doing. I jump to conclusions. I climb the walls. I drag my heels. I push my luck. I make mountains out of moles, hills. I bend over backwards. I run around in circles. I put my foot in my mouth. I go over the edge. I beat around the bush. So he's exercising, but staying the same. So the first way to apply the Word of God when God says, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you every place you set your foot. And the second great truth is start today. Get started today. Get out of the land, out of the life, out of the place you are, and get started today. Today. You know, the writer of Hebrews, writing to early Jewish believers, so they had a whole background of these Old Testament stories, he, he talks about the experience of these Hebrews when they got out of Egypt, they got up to the promised land, they sent the spies in the land, they found giants in the land, they were afraid, they didn't believe God, they disobeyed God. And he talks about that, and he uses it for you and me. And in the third chapter of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 15, he's quoting from the psalmist in the 95th Psalm, where the psalmist is going back and reflecting over their history and the failure to enter into the promised land. You say, why do they wander for 40 years in the desert? Well, first of all, because Moses was a man, and men don't stop and ask for directions. But other than that, they refuse to go in. The reason you don't have a better life is you're the one refusing to go in. The only one who can change your life is you. The only one who can change your marriage is you. The only one who can change your finances is you. The only one who can, can affect your spiritual growth is you. I'll give you every place you set your foot. Get started today. And he says there in Hebrews 3, 15, kind of reflecting on that experience when they wouldn't go further, they ended up staying in the desert, things stay the same. Hebrews 3, 15, he says, today, everybody say today. Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. That's when they rebelled against him in the desert and doubted God's word. Now, think about that. Today, if you hear God's voice, today, even as I'm sharing the word of God, if you hear God's voice, if you hear God speak to you, God move upon your heart, do not harden your heart. What is that? It could be saying, well, it doesn't apply to me. It could be saying, well, it doesn't really work. It could be saying, well, I don't believe that's true. Whatever it is, I don't take the word to heart and I don't act upon it today. Today, if you hear God's voice, do not resist it. Do not stay the way you are. Now, I want to tell you something this morning that I've discovered about getting started today. A call to action. Everything in life has to eventually boil down to action, right? You have the right attitude. You have the right approach. You've got a great plan. But all of that is to take action. Like he says in 1 Peter 1, 13, prepare your minds for action. Part of my preaching this morning, I want to prepare your minds and mine for action this year. You probably have heard James 2, 17, faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith without works, without action, is dead. This is what I've discovered about taking action in our lives. Talking is not action. A discussion is not doing. Meditating about it is the same, is different from moving something. And what I've observed, and I had this kind of a new observation lately, that we substitute talking for action. We substitute discussions for doing. And the thing about talking is you feel better after you do it, right? You get your thoughts out, your feelings out. You maybe vent a little bit, and it feels great. And it feels like I just did something. I went and talked to somebody about it. You ever said to somebody, what are you doing about it? They said, well, I went to talk to somebody about it. Well, that's not the answer. 
The, the question is, what are you doing about it? You were talking about what you were going to do, but the talking and the doing are two different things. And I observe this in meetings. And you all have them, right? School meetings and parent meetings, church meetings, leadership meetings, corporate meetings. That may be the great thing about heaven. There are no more meetings. I once read that God so loved the world, he did not appoint a committee. So I observed this in church leadership meetings. You know, we go sit in a meeting all morning. Which really, you sit around for three hours, it's enough to give you a blood clot. Even an airplane, they tell you to get up and walk around. <laughs> Long meetings can't be healthy. So I noticed in meetings over time, things would be discussed, and then somebody would document it and take minutes. And in the next meeting, they'd read the minutes again. Y'all ever done this? I know you have. And the action for the next meeting is just to read about the previous meeting and the things you said, well, I'll make a motion and we table that till the next meeting. <clears throat> and then after you sat around and met for an hour and a half, for two hours or three hours, you're totally exhausted. Then you go out to lunch. Everybody's getting hungry, having visions of OK Cafe. Thank the Lord it came back. <laughs> right? You're thinking of your favorite restaurant. It's, 11.45, would you please just give us a break? Let us out 15 minutes early, please. I was in a continued education seminar for therapy recently. I would have given the guy $100. All my mind could, he, we went to 4 o'clock. He went all the way to 4. I kept thinking, I'll give you 100 bucks if you will just stop talking. <laughs> Don't even let us out. Just stop talking. Because if you go to all day 8 to 4, by, by 11.30, you've heard all they got to say. <clears throat> they just got to fill up the day. And then you go to lunch. You have a great lunch. You feel great about yourself. And you have this feeling of accomplishment. You have this feeling of satisfaction. You met all morning. You went to your favorite restaurant. You weren't going to have dessert, but you had to reward yourself for enduring the meeting. Right? Or you go to marriage counseling and you have a great session. Everybody vents. They get it out. You hug. You kiss. We did something. You go to the banker about your finances or financial consultant. They give you a book to read. They give you a budget to work on. You say, man, I feel better. But things usually... Stay just like they are. Because talking is not acting. And discussing is not doing. And he says, I'll give you every place you talk about. I'll give you every place you pray about. I'll give you every place you study about. He says, I'll give you every place you set your foot. And the foot is good for one thing, to get moving. You have to step you have to take action. That's what God, I encourage you to give God something to bless. I love that scripture in Psalm 37, 25. In the old King James, it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. But it's the steps that are ordered. It's not the standing still that is ordered. It is the action of moving that God looks for and that God blesses. Give God something to bless this year. Take some action in your life. And start today. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing today. Amen. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing today. It's a true story. I, I read about a couple. They're in their 90s. They've been married 70 years, and they go to a restaurant. It's a very popular restaurant. It was very crowded. The man and his wife are standing there, and the hostess it says, he tells the man, we want a dinner for two. And he says, do you have reservations? He said, no. And the hostess said, well, it'll be an hour. And the man said, son, let me tell you something. My wife and in her mid-90s, we may not have an hour. <laughs> and they were seated immediately. <laughs> There's a great story found only in the Gospel of Luke. It's not in the other Gospels. Toward the end of Jesus' ministry, Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 19, he was 
going around through Samaria down to the south up to the Galilee. He was going back to Jerusalem. They came through a village, and outside the village there were 10 lepers, men with all kinds of infectious disease, 10 of them. And when they saw Jesus, of course, John tells us he had been to Samaria. Remember the famous story of the woman at the well? He had stayed in Samaria several days. He had preached the good news of the kingdom. They recognized him, and they just said, Jesus, Master, take pity on us. And Jesus walked up to the lepers, and it says they stood at a distance because they were lepers, and they, they knew that they couldn't come near him. So he goes over to them, and he says, Go show yourself to the priest. Well, this is in accordance with the law of Moses. A person with a disease was to go pre present themselves to the priest because the priests were also physicians for the people. The first word he said is go. They say, take pity on us. We're going to be healed of leprosy. And the first word out of his mouth is the word go. Everybody say go. Go, go ahead and irritate somebody else and tell them go. Go. I know you know how to do that because you do it at traffic lights all the time, right? <laughs> They want to be healed. They want to get out of the place of disease, into the place of wholeness, and the prescription is go. Go show yourself to the priest. Now, Luke chapter 10, verse 14 says, as they went, they were cleansed. And this idea of sitting around and saying, well, when I'm healed, when I'm restored, when I'm together, then I'm going I'm to take the next step in my life. Your healing, your restoration, your maturity, your deliverance, your success comes as you go. Amen. As they went, they were cleansed. So if we're going to move further into the promises God has for us, we've got to get out of the place we're living. And we've got to get started today. And the last truth that I learned from this statement to Joshua is we have got to get grounded in the promises of God. This is why we have so much anxiety and worry. We're not grounded in the promises of God. So he says, I'll give you, there's blessings of God, every foot, there's your action, every step you take as I promised Moses. That the action of faith is rooted in the promise of God. And I got to thinking about this. Moses, interesting, because Moses is the first author of Scripture, right? He gave us the first five books of the Bible. So you could also say, God is saying, I will give you every place you set your foot as I promised in my word. Because those promises he gave to Moses are written down even for us. And there are many more. There are 3,500 promises in the Bible. And I'm not talking about faith in faith. I'm not sitting up here as some just motivational speaker telling you to believe. I'm telling you to believe in God. To direct your faith to God, not to yourself, not to corporations, not to other people, not to your abilities, but to have faith in God. That's what Jesus told his disciples in Mark 11, 22. Have faith in God. Hebrews 11, 1 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. There's the promise. It is the evidence of things not seen. Get your faith this year, as I do, grounded in the promises of God in Scripture. You know, God's promises are unfailing. 1 Kings 8, 56. There's not one word failed of His good promise. His promises are universal. They're for everyone. Acts 3, 19. The promise is for you and your children and all that are far off and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. God's promises are fulfilled by his power, not mine, not yours, by his. Romans chapter 4 verse 21 says, Abraham believed that God had power to do what he promised. The promises of God for us are rooted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. 
And the amen, that's a word of agreement. When you and I say amen, I say, I believe that is the word of God. The amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. And the promises of God will change the way we live. It says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Dear friends, since we have these precious promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of our reverence for God. God's promises are faithful and true. They're great and they're precious. That means they're very valuable. That's what the word precious in the Greek means. And Peter says that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. He has given us his great, his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. And then if we think that God's not going to come through, he reminds us in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, God is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness, but he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. 1 John 2 and 25, this is what he promised us, even eternal life. All of us suffer those feelings of inadequacy, the feelings of impossibility, that this is impossible, I can't accomplish it, or this can never change. But it can. And it will change our lives when we begin to hear God say, I will give you every place you set your foot as I promised in my word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. What do you need God to do in your life this year? What do you need God to do in your life, in your marriage? Have you grown hopeless about something? So discouraged because it stays the way it is? Let faith rise in your heart this morning. The Bible says in Romans that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says God so loved the world, God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the greatest of all the promises. And right where you are, you can open your heart to the Lord Jesus and pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness. I receive you this day, Lord Jesus, as my Savior, and I commit my life to you. The Bible says if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. I want you to bring whatever that is in your heart. Maybe you have goals for this year. Maybe you have problems you want to overcome. Maybe your relationships, some of them are struggling With God, all things are possible. They are possible. Jesus said that, Matthew 19, 26. And God told Joshua, everything's possible for you. If you'll set your foot there by faith, you say, grounded in my promises, not looking at your problems, I'll give you every place you set your foot. Lord, this year, We bring before you the needs of our hearts. We bring before you the desires of our hearts. We bring before you the problems in our lives. We bring before you, Lord, the impossible situations that we face. And by faith, we ask and receive your intervention, your miracle power, your direction, your provision for this year. We're not going to step into this year, Father, with fear, but with faith. Not with worry, but with worship. Not with anxiety, but with assurance. Because you alone are able to do more than we ask or even think possible. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said amen.